And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning and welcome to the show. Of course, it's Thursday and today is the last trading day of the month because tomorrow's Good Friday and of course this weekend is Easter. Markets are closed tomorrow. So today we'll wrap up the trading for the month. It'll also wrap up the trading for the quarter. And again, a little bit yesterday as we saw right at the end of the day, the market had market traded mostly negative yesterday. Then right at the end of the day, had a, a kind of pop into positive territory, very nice little rally into the end of the day. So again, you know, that was this kind of this, this quarter end rebalancing that's going on. So, uh, you know, not surprising uh, that we kind of see this volatility pick up in the markets. But again, today I'll wrap that up and then we're going to start by next week, um, start gearing up for earnings season, which will kind of kick off the second week of April. We'll start getting earnings reports for the first quarter coming in and, uh, you know, then it's kind of you know, we go from there because, uh, again, it's millennial earning season. Uh, estimates have been lowered rather dramatically for the first quarter, as usual. So, again, we'll just go through the whole, hey, we beat estimates by a penny, even though we lowered the estimates a whole bunch. You know how, you know how, you know how the game goes by now. So, uh, but we'll start that in April. That should give a little bit of support uh, to the markets, uh, only because earnings will continue to be good. At this point, there's really no reason for them not to be. So again, markets have been doing you know fairly well. We'll talk. We're going to talk about a couple of different markets here in just a minute uh, when we do our before the bell segment. Now, outside of that, economic data continues to come in mixed. As we talked a little bit about yesterday on the manufacturing side of the index, not so great. On the services side of the index, everything seems to be okay. Housing data, we're starting to see housing prices improve. That's starting to, to provide a, another lift in confidence. Again, as we talk about overall consumer confidence, that's been improving very well as we discussed yesterday. Consumers are very optimistic, uh, especially on asset prices. So they, they now have the highest level of confidence in the retirement accounts uh, pretty much ever on record. So they are very optimistic about further stock price increases, which again, uh, as we talked about before, is, is interesting because there's so much negativity, uh, you know, in terms of articles that you see or, or views about this, that, or the other thing and how this is all going to be a major problem down the road. But again, as far as the markets look at it, not really so much the case. Everything is, is fine. It's about as bullish as you can get. But, you know, therein lies a little bit of concern just from the fact that everybody is in the pool <laughs> at this point. I mean, uh, asset allocations are getting very long in the tooth. In other words, people are very heavily allocated towards markets. Retail investors are heavily involved in the options market. They are taking on a lot of leverage bets right now and taking on a lot of option risk, particularly heading into earnings season. So we're really starting to see those options uh, kind of runs pick up here. Again, just from that, again, it's been an easy market to make money in. And as is always the case, it's, it's, I'm, I'm already starting to see the Facebook post, right? You know, Facebook post, it's so easy to make money in the markets. You just throw money in the markets and, and you make money. It's just that simple. That's typically what you see, you know, very kind of late stage market cycles. And again, but that's where we are. Now, one thing we're going to be talking about this weekend in the newsletter, talk a little bit, we're going to kind of preview earnings season this weekend in the newsletter. But the one thing in particular here is that asset prices are running faster than valuations. And so remember, valuations are price divided by earnings. And so earnings have been improving, right? So if, if valuations are improving, I'm oh, sorry, if earnings are improving, valuations should be coming forward, valuations should be coming down, right? Because um, the E is going up and assuming that your P is, is stable, right? Then your valuation markets should come down. The problem is, is price is rising so fast in the markets right now that it's outpacing even the most optimistic earnings upgrade. So valuations are actually rising fairly sharply. Even on a 10-year trailing basis, we're now over 34 times earnings. That's very, that's very expensive historically. But again, it's just a function that the market is pricing in whatever valuation, whatever earnings increase we're getting, the markets are pricing in that and more. So the optimism going forward, expecting continued earnings growth is extremely elevated. 
So you've already had a very big earnings recovery starting in October of 2022 till now. We've seen earnings recover nicely. But the expectations are is that earnings will grow extremely strongly going forward from here. And the problem with that is that that's a function of economic growth. So uh, what markets are expecting right now is a very strong rate of, of economic growth over the course of the next couple of years to help support current valuations. That's probably going to be a tough bet to make. We'll see what happens, but uh, there is a lot of improvement going on in the overall markets. In fact, here's what you need to know before the bell this morning. So we've talked about the equal weight index has been underperforming rather dramatically over the last year or so. Um, in fact, the difference between the equal weight index and the S&P, which is the market cap weighted index, has been about two to one. Uh, for quite a while now. That's been changing as of late. The equal weight index has really been uh, getting some traction over the last two months. And we've talked about seeing this rotation in the markets where, where money starts to come out of the mega cap, uh, Magnificent 7 stocks, rotating to other areas like REITs and utilities. And we've seen that here recently. And just over the last two months, that now uh, the RSP, the equal weighted index, is still lagging the S&P 500, but that gap is starting to close a bit. And we've had a very strong run in equal weighted indexes with equal weight breaking out to all time highs. And again, yesterday making an all time high again yesterday. So we are starting to see that rally broaden out here a bit. The number of stocks that are above their 200 day moving average has improved markedly. So the breadth of the overall S&P has improved. Um, and again, this equal weight index has been doing well here again. Uh, much, you know, moving very high and, and we've seen this, this movement into that. Mid caps have also been doing just as well. When we take a look at the mid cap index, it's been actually pacing. It's actually outpacing 500 on a year to date basis, but it too has been making a all time high on the mid cap index. Now, outside of those two, uh, most every other index is still lagging pretty dramatically. In fact, small caps are the biggest laggard still to date. Um, in fact, since 2020, you know, it's kind of, a, sorry, it's 2022 at the peak of the market, it's still running a negative uh, return since 2022. Small caps have yet to really kind of break out here. And again, if we take a look back um, over the last couple of years, small caps have, have just really kind of continued to lag. So it's been really mega cap, market cap weighted stocks, followed by mid caps, followed by equal weight indexes. Everything else is pretty much still lagging, particularly in the emerging markets and international space, those areas lagging as well. Uh, the one thing that's kind of gotten our attention here over the last couple of days though, is bonds because bonds have actually been doing, a, a, a picking up a little bit nicely in price here. Yields have been coming down a bit and uh, yields have been picking up here. Um, and what's interesting with, with bonds in particular is that there's a big cluster of moving averages. So the 50, the 100 day, the 200 day moving average have all now just coalesced into a very tight spot. Yesterday, that rally in bond prices and drop in yields pushed bond prices above all those moving averages. So you're now at the junction where we're gonna start having quite a few of the moving averages crossing positives, or you're gonna start getting bullish crosses of these moving averages above, above other moving averages, but also the price has now cleared that resistance level of that cluster of support. So again, if, if bond prices can hold here and then begin to build support above these moving averages, that's gonna become a much more kind of bullish setup for bond prices here in the near term. And here's what's also interesting from this is that we've got a very nice uh, kind of uh, consolidation pennant that's been going on. So again, if bond prices can move up a bit here over the course of the next week or two or three, uh, we're gonna get a breakout of this consolidation, which will also support uh, bond, uh, bonds for higher prices. So again, uh, kind of a bullish setup occurring here. You're on a MACD buy signal as well. You're not completely overbought yet. So again, kind of a, a bit of a bullish short-term setup here. Again, I think bonds have a bit more work to do because of what's going on with the Fed and temporary inflation, but the setup for bonds is starting to look a lot better as we start to move further and later into this year. Okay, that's what you need to know before the bell this morning. When we come back, we'll pick up with Michael Leibowitz talking about liquidity. Um, so we'll get into that right after the break. Don't go away.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. In 1999, a parafiduciary group of financial advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA plan or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Invest- Show. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax friendly retirement paycheck, perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance, guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning? At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855 RIA Plan, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment advice.com and now another page from the real investment advisors investing manifesto a passive investment portfolio requires active risk management it's not a choice it's necessity diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss let us actively help you reach your financial goals with ria advisors neither bull nor bear ria advisors 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com you're listening to the real investment show So welcome back to the show this morning. Um, today we've got a, a good bit of economic data coming out because tomorrow is a holiday. So you've got uh, GDP third estimate coming out this morning. Uh, that's expected to come in at 3.2%. Uh, the deflator will be about 1.7. That's the expectation right now. Um, so again, just kind of in line with this. Um, now that's, that's also uh, the estimates for the fourth quarter GDP, not first quarter GDP. So this is just wrapping up 2023. Uh, so that'll come out. Initial claim, Chicago PMI, another cinnamon index, University of Michigan cinnamon index will be out today. Uh, we just saw the conference board out here just the other day, uh, pending home sales as well. So, so again, you know, we're starting to, you know, kind of just get some of this economic data out of the way. Then next Friday, I believe, is going to be the employment report. So we'll have that coming up as well. Of course, this is you know kind of all what and then tomorrow is also uh personal consumption expenditures so that and and next friday's employment report will feed into a little bit of the market's views on what the fed may be thinking when in terms of cutting rates or when they might cut so again a couple of important reports are coming up uh to kind of pay attention to um outside of that you know that's it's been interesting because you know the market's been you know doing well and financial conditions have dropped sharply. And in fact, financial conditions are now weaker or, or, or looser. I shouldn't say weaker because they're not weak. Um, but financial conditions are now looser than they were even before the Fed started hiking rates. And in fact, the decline in financial conditions has a, a acted as an equivalent of about 100 basis points of rate cuts. And at the same time, monetary supply in the market has been rising rather dramatically over the last five, six months. So we've had an increase in monetary supply, a big drop in financial conditions, and you wonder why stocks are going up. Well, so Mike addressed some of this in his article on Wednesday. Mike, welcome to the show this morning. So yeah, Thank financial you. conditions, easy, easy, easy. You got to love it if you're in the stock market. Yeah. So here's the way I kind of think about financial conditions and borrowing conditions. The Fed has this very elaborate machine, but at the end of the day, they have two knobs borrowing conditions and financial conditions, and they can adjust those two knobs to try to steer the economy, try to steer economic growth, try to manage inflation. 
meet all their what they're supposed to do according to their Fed mandates. So what they've been doing is really tightening borrowing conditions for the last few years, right? They raised rates over five to five and a quarter to five and a half percent. They've enacted QT. Uh, we've seen consumer borrowing um, is slowing down pretty rapidly, um, you know, because credit card rates are over 20 percent now. Auto loans are now seven plus percent. Mortgages are seven percent. We've actually seen negative growth in uh, commercial and industrial loans. Those are basically loans to corporations. So, so some of what they've been doing is had it, have, ha, has had their desired effect. But then at the same time, they're very concerned about the lag effect. Uh, they mention it every time they have a Fed meeting that there's still this, all these high, the higher rates will eventually feed into the economy. So what they're doing is easing up on the the other knob, the financial conditions. They're talking about rate cuts. They're talking about eliminating QT. Uh, they're they're talking about the potential for a Goldilocks soft landing economy, and all that is kind of spurring the speculative juices in the markets. And financial conditions, at the end of the day, is really just a market sentiment gauge. So. You know, they're, they got these two offsetting buttons and I feel like they're or knobs and I feel like they're hedging uh, tighter borrowing conditions and a potential lag effect with uh, easier financial conditions. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting conversation because, again, you know, we keep talking. We've been talking about the lag effect now for it's a long time, right? A couple of years now. It's been like, OK, yeah, these these rate hikes, they take a while to work their way through the system. There's this lag effect that's going to catch up. Um, hasn't really seemed to be the case. Uh, economic data still seems to be doing well. Um, you know, uh, manufacturing data has been improving, although it's still weak. Service sector data is uh, back in expansion territory. So, you know, we keep talking about this lag effect, but it has yet really to show up in any kind of form or fashion. Yeah, I mean, you know, a couple of things to consider with that is that rates were low for a pretty long period, very, you know, historically low, talking the lowest rates this country has ever seen, you know, since going, you know, going all the way back to the 1700s. And a lot of consumers refinanced their mortgages at 3%. A lot of corporations refinanced their debt at very low rates. So, a lot of people, a lot of companies are comfortable. They don't need to borrow yet, but as time progresses, ultimately debt matures and people have to borrow mm -hmm. uh, and corporations have to borrow. So, you know, it, and, and then you have all the stimulus and the government running, you know, what are unprecedented deficits in a very good economy. You know, we've just never seen deficits this large in an economy that is this strong. The, the type of deficits we're running are made for are more typical of recessions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's still the stimulus from the from the pandemic floating around. So, you know, you have those kind of three factors that are for now defying the lag effect. Well, that and then but there's there's also one thing to consider is that, you know, the longer that you go. So you're right about the fact that people refinance a lot of their debt at low rates. They don't need to do anything right now. But the longer that rates stay elevated, the economy becomes accustomed to it. And this is the one thing I think that people are overlooking is that, you know, there was a time where getting a mortgage on your house. Well, I remember my first mortgage was over 10 percent. Right. And that was normal. And, and nobody blinked an eye at getting a 10 percent mortgage. That was just the way it was at the time. And that was actually cheaper than the 17 percent mortgage that my parents had. Right. So it was like, oh, this is a good deal. I'm getting it at 10. My parents had at 17. Um, so the longer that rates stay elevated, so if mortgage rates stay elevated at 6 or 7%, that'll become normal uh, to new borrowers as they come in the market. They're, oh, okay, well, it's 6%. Okay, that's what it is. And this is my house payment. And then we make adjustments, and housing companies are already doing this. Uh, housing builders are building smaller houses. So in order to compensate for higher rates, they're building smaller square footage houses. So this will all become normality at some point. So the expectation that eventually this is going to catch up and there's going to be this big downturn in the economy, there's going to be a recession, that's a function of time. And it's a function of whether the catch-up of the lag effect occurs before normality sets in, right? Right. Well, it may become more normality, but the fact of the matter is that a mortgage is now almost twice what it was two, year, two three years ago. Yeah, but, but so if I've never had a mortgage, I don't care. 
Well, you do because it affects all your other spending. So if you were going to spend 30 percent on of your income on a mortgage in 2021, mm -hmm. but you didn't pull the trigger and you're going to do it now, it may cost you 50, 60 percent of your salary, at which point you have that 20 or 30 percent less to spend on other things. So it, it may become a normal mortgage rate, but it just impedes the amount of money people can spend. Well, it does unless you buy a smaller square footage house. That's my point, right? right? So right, right. in other words, so we got you're used buying to, less. Well, that, correct. That's the point. You're buying less, whether it's smaller house or less of other stuff. Correct. Right. But th but that's the whole that's my whole point is that once it becomes mm -hmm. normality, instead of buying McMansions like we were back in 2007, 2008, now we're buying McShacks. And, you know, but that's completely normal. We're OK with that. Right. The McShack is now the new thing. And that's going to be, you know, we've already talked about, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, millennials that are coming up and these Gen Z's and they're buying many houses and building, you know, 300 square foot houses that they're living in and, and, and living in mobile houses, converting vans to houses, those type of things. Uh, this, and if that becomes the more of the mindset and now with home builders starting to build smaller square footage homes, yeah, I may still be spending 30% of my income on a house. I'm buying a lot smaller house, but it's still 30% of my income, right? right. Even though it's a 6% mortgage. Right, right. But but some of that is good, right? We talked about how, you know, previously, a few years ago, we talked about how low rates just create mm -hmm. uh, Malinvestment. this unnecessary consumption. Yeah. Well, it, that, that's true. And again, it, it creates malinvestment. And, and, and again, but the, the, the question is, and, and really kind of the focus is that, you know, the Fed is, is working to increase liquidity into the market so it seems as if they're worried about something where it you know if you look around the world right now there doesn't seem to be any real risk credit spreads are extremely tight there doesn't seem to be any risk in the credit markets whatsoever um you know the economy's clepping along just fine three point what, what's today going to be 3.2 percent uh for the fourth quarter so mm -hmm. again doesn't seem to be any problem yet the fed is acting as if there's a concern of liquidity right around the corner and that's why they're going to start cutting rates and and, and and reversing QT because of this concern that really doesn't show up in any of the data anywhere at least not at this point right right I agree 100 percent they know or they think there's a liquidity issue in the near future yeah but where because because again well, it's, I, it's it's the it's not in the banks and it's not in the households well, it will be though Right. Where? We know we've talked about this before that the reverse repo program is going to zero and yeah. with it, excess liquidity goes to zero. And then when the Treasury has to issue debt, they're draining it from the, the broader market, not from the Fed program. And that's where I think the rubber hits the road, whenever that may be, whether it's, you know, April or June right. or May. Okay. Well, I guess we're going to find out. So. <laughs> All right, quick break. We'll come back. Um, all right, so the market's doing great. Not really much to worry about, or is there? We'll talk about uh, some of the outlying risk, you know, potentially for the markets. We come back from the break. Don't go away. Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. Oh, Red, I declare. I plumb missed that candy coffee. Whatever am I going to do? Don't you worry, little darling. We'll watch it again on our YouTube channel. Why, Red? I never. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all of our past presentations from Candid Coffee and Lunch and Learn, the special topic discussions, and all of our live show recordings preserved for you. Subscribe now to the Real Investment Show YouTube channel or look for the link on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. 
there's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Just simply click ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. Food in total is now making up 30% of the average discretionary income. I believe it. I mean, that yeah. is our largest expense is food. Yeah. And, and we rarely eat out. The Real Investment Show podcast. Our biggest frustration at home is how do we do this cheaper? Yeah. No, I agree. Better. I agree. We're, we're running hunger games at our house. At realinvestmentadvice.com. <laughs> so, you know, if you can make it to the table without getting killed, you get to eat. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax friendly retirement paycheck. Perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance? Guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855 RIA Plan, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, plus each day's radio shows. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. So, you know, we're trying to talk about the market. So the markets right now is poised to have one of the best starts to a year since 2019. Got to go way back to there. Um, and then 20, what's interesting about 2019, if we go back to that point, then really heading into 2020, the market was on this very accelerated run higher. And, you know, at that time we were talking about deviations from long-term means was were, were rather extreme. Um people writing articles about a market melt up. And now you look at a chart of the markets back in 2019, it looks like a blip, right? It's just, it's been so dwarfed by this move in the market since the 2020 lows because of all this liquidity and stimulus and everything else that's been floating out there. Monetary supply has continued, uh, you know, to come into the markets. And again, that's why markets keep going up. And here we are about to clip off one of the best beginnings of a year since 2019. In fact, we've been up five months in a row, which is something that going back to 1900 has only happened 22 times previously. So it's, it's you know, five months in a row happen, but it's not like an every every year occurrence, right? So it's, it's it, and again, you always have to ask the question, well, what happens next? And, you know, when you're up five months, you can certainly be up six months, you can certainly be up seven months, but those become much more rare um, in history, uh, being up that many months in a row without having a down month, at least, if not a bigger correction at some point. So you always have to remember that when people talk about records or this is the biggest run since here or since there, um, records are records for a reason, right? Because eventually they get broken of, for whatever it is. Um, and then, and that's always something to keep in mind. So the question becomes really is, you know, this market is very bullish. It's very optimistic. Um, are there really any risk out there to be paying attention to that, you know, could step up and surprise the markets? And is it something that, 
the markets are prepared for. So, you know, Mike, what do you think? I mean, you know, it doesn't seem to be any real risk out there at the moment that are going to upset markets. You know, is there anything on the on the horizon that you're watching? No, absolutely. You got a uh, dovish Fed, relatively dovish, right? I mean, they're pushing out rate cuts, but the fact that they're even talking about rate cuts and reducing QT, given that inflation has become a little sticky and it's still well above 2% and you got a strong economy is, you know, that's a Goldilocks type scenario for the markets. Uh, there's really nothing, you know, we have an election, not till November, but it's pretty clear who, you know, it's going to be Trump against Biden. Uh, so, you know, maybe as we get towards later summer, early fall, the ramifications of who may win and what that may mean may have an effect on the markets. Um, but for now, I, I think the risk is going back is liquidity. But I want to just clarify something. Just because there's liquidity issues doesn't mean that translates to economic issues. So we could have uh, like in 2019, we had liquidity issues, but the economy was still hanging in there. Uh, eventually, liquidity problems trip up the banking system, which then trip up the economy. So again, I think liquidity is an issue, but the Fed seems to get it. They talk, they're talk; they talking publicly about it, and it sounds like they're making plans, whether it's reducing QT or maybe even eventually going to QE despite high inflation. Um, so, so the question in my mind is liquidity is a potential answer to your question, but can or will the Fed mitigate it in time so that, you know, that, that it's not a 10, 20 percent drawdown, it's a two or three percent drawdown that breaks the, uh, the, the monthly winning streak. Yeah. And again, we, you know, we never know that question. And, you know, at some point, you know, there's going to be a much bigger correction of, of, you know, whatever causes it and whenever it occurs, uh, you know, it could be a year from now, it could be five years from now. But, you know, again, we'll go through a period where there's a 20 or 25 percent correction in the market. So we're going to retest longer term moving averages that'll occur. And, the, and the, the problem is that we never know what's going to cause it. Right. I mean, it, there's there be something that shows up out of the blue somewhere. Some something fails somewhere and that causes this, you know, shift between buyers and sellers. And 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 we have this correction in the markets. I thought it was interesting because uh, there was an article in, in Yahoo today, JP Morgan uh, is talking about that stocks have become extremely crowded. And, you know, that's and that's kind of an important point, because, again, when everybody's ha has bought. Right. The, the question becomes is who's left to buy. And we, we were talking about this a little bit on Monday is that, you know, markets are markets. They're they're supply demand driven. So in, in one room, you've got a lot of buyers in the other room, you've got a lot of sellers. Well, to get the sellers to sell at this point, they don't really want to sell because their, their stock prices are going up. So I don't want to sell my Apple. I don't want to sell my Google. I don't want to sell whatever it is because the price is going up. I don't want to miss out. But in order to be enticed to sell, buyers have to say, okay, well, I'll pay you this price more than where it's currently trading. So prices have to come up to entice those sellers to sell. Well, the problem with that is that at some point something happens and the buyers will want to become sellers. And the problem is there'll be no buyers on the other side. And that's where buyers live a lot lower. And that's where you have these market corrections of some sort. And that's kind of the point that JP Morgan was uh, was making. It says it's it's the talk of the stock market. What will be the sign that the five month rally in US equities is coming to an end? If you ask JP Morgan's head of equities, investors may not see it coming when it hits. Well that's always the case. <laughs> investors never see it coming. You know, that's why they they tend to buy high and sell low because the same thing happens. And, uh, you know, he, he comes up with this brilliant explanation here. It just might come out one day out of the blue. This has happened in the past when hot when we've had flash crashes within the market. One big fund starts to delever some positions. The second fund hears about that, tries to reposition. The third fund basically gets caught off guard. The next thing you know, we're starting to have a bigger momentum unwind. That's the point that we talk about here where buyers live a lot lower because as hedge funds and major institutions have to start deleveraging positions, there's nobody else out there to buy because everybody's trying to sell at the same time. Right. But the writing's always on the wall. 1987, the writing was on the wall for a few weeks before that happened, both in legislation that was being proposed and in technical indicators. Uh, but, you know, let's look back to, to 2000 and 2008. 2020 was a little different because of the pandemic, and that was unpredictable. 
But in 2006, you could start to see that house prices had start to flatten and were reversing in many cases. And for a market predicated on uh, leverage, so much leverage predicated on higher house prices, that was a big problem. Uh, but it didn't manifest itself till mid-2008. In, um, you know, in 1998, late 98, early 99, we could have the same conversation we're having today. This market is crazy. None of these valuations make sense. But it went on for almost a year longer at that point. So, you know, it's not that investors don't see it. The problem is that investors that see it and react to it get out too early, too. Right. So you may miss the last 20 or 30 percent of a rally and you're ultimately proven right. But it, the market has to fall 20 or 30 percent till your break even. And then, you know, on the other hand, a lot of people just don't see the signs or they see the signs and choose to ignore them. And they, they're caught on the other side. So it's you know, it's this fine tightrope that we have to walk between seeing the signs, understanding the signs, but understanding what the market tells us day to day. And what is, does the market see the problems that, that we anticipate or not? And how, how does it change? How do the technicals alert us to a change in investor behavior? Kind of like what you're talking about, mm -hmm. where the buyers become less aggressive and the sellers become more aggressive. Yeah, I guess, you know, and again, we've talked about before, if, if there's ever a place to be looking for, you know, market related risk, it's always to go to the credit market and pay attention to what's happening with spreads. And there certainly doesn't seem to be any pressure on credit spreads whatsoever. So, you know, we talk about tighter lending standards. And yeah, maybe banks don't want to loan money to individuals right now or businesses because they're worried about whatever. Uh, we are starting to see those loosen up a bit. But you know, maybe they don't want to make loans, but there's certainly no sign of risk in the credit markets, you know, in terms of, you know, of def you know really surging defaults or surging delinquencies. We're seeing some delinquencies in credit cards. We're seeing some delinquencies in small business loans, but nothing that's really impacting, you know, the, the credit markets to any degree at this point. Well, correct. If you look at credit spreads, but there is an interesting, uh, Bloomberg put out an interesting graph a day or two ago leveraged loan default rates are starting to rise rapidly. They're now up to 6%, which if you exclude uh, 2020, where they got to about 7, 8%, they're back down at 2008 levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, the high, you know, they, they kind of are, the, the running average has been about 3%. So they've doubled. So that may be the first indication that heavy indebted, you know, heavy heavily indebted companies um, that are poorly rated are starting to have problems. So we'll see if this trickles into the more traditional junk debt markets, you know, the, the B rated, double B rated. Uh, and then if that's the case, you should expect to start to see it in some of the weaker investment grade companies kind of moving up the ladder. Right. Well, and again, this is and, and that that's kind of your again, that's kind of if you're trying to find, you know, an indicator to pay attention to it says, OK, is there stress in the markets? Is there something here that is, is you know, could potentially, you know, clip a good chunk off the equity market? It'll show up in the credit markets. Um, and, and so that's why it's an important reason to pay attention to what's happening with credit markets, what's happening with credit spreads to see if there's financial stress, you know, kind of beginning to occur. And again, we, as we talked about earlier, you know, the Fed is worried about this lack of liquidity uh, in the markets as the repo uh, facility goes towards zero. Um, you know, so if there's going to be some problems with banks, we should start seeing it show up in some credit spreads, credit spreads somewhere as well. All right, we'll come back from the break. Uh, get ready to wrap up the show for this morning. Don't go away. Daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. 
The Real Investment Show YouTube page has all of our videos ready for your easy access. From three minutes on markets and money to each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show. Or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven-layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax-friendly retirement paycheck, perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance? Guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855-RIA-PLAN, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com, realinvestmentadvice.com. Com. The Real Investment Show. Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA plan or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. You know, we talk a lot on this show. Mike's got uh, kids in college right now. I've got kids in college, and it seemed like just yesterday you're putting them in diapers and swatting them on the butt. But, um, you know, time flies, and, you know, we're trying to prepare our kids to go out in the world and be good stewards of, of the economy and of, of their neighborhoods, et cetera. Just be good people, right? That's, that's you know, for any parent, we just kind of want two things. We want our kids to grow up and be good, productive citizens in, in the economy and, and to do better than we did ourselves, right? That's, that's every father's dream is that his son can or daughter can do better than he did. Right. And Lance, and, Lance yeah. and we want him out of the house and we want him out of the house. True. This is this is a true statement, but they're out of the house now. So but we just want to off the payroll. But right. When they're done with college. <laughs> exactly. A uh, new report this morning um, has found that 68 percent of small business owners say Gen Z employees are the least reliable. 71% say they're most likely to have mental health issues in the workplace. One of the employers surveyed spoke of Gen Z's absolute delusion, complete lack of common sense, and cr zero critical reasoning or basic analytical skills. And this is according to the Freedom Economy uh, Index or report that was uh, done by Public Square and Red Balloon earlier this Red Balloon's a hiring agency uh, earlier this month. Less than 4% of those surveys said Gen Z was the generation that most aligns with their workplace culture. 62% said Gen Zs were most likely to create division and toxicity in the workplace. And, you know, it's interesting because, and, and Mike, this is, you know, I know you deal with this. I, you know, I, I, you know, I make sure and stay on my kids, you know, constantly about this. You know, I read these articles and I see these reports and, and I've seen this actually in the real life workplace as well. We've, you know, we've seen this, but, you know, it's interesting when I talk to my kids um, and their friend groups, et cetera, you know, they have a, a, a very different attitude than what we kind of get from the social media front. I, I, I should get, I, I should say, right. There, there's certainly this attitude on social media that we see. And in fact, there was, you know, I've, I've, there was this video out there that was like, if you're having to work a nine to five job, how are you supposed to have any time to have a life? <laughs> right. You know, you know, and, and that certainly that that certainly, you know, is is out there. But, you know, I look at a lot of, of young kids that are in college coming out of college and, you know, they have a good work ethic. They want to work. They want to succeed. They want to, you know, invest and and create opportunity there for themselves and, and do well. Um, you know, but there is this certain, you know, attitude that's out there. And, and again, you know, we see this 
you know, from more of the, you know, from blue states as well, where there's a lot of kind of liberal attitudes and liberal push, you know, we see these kind of more toxic attitudes that do come out in the workplace, but there still seems to be a very large underpinning of, you know, these young kids in college that have, I, I, you, know, I, you know, I hate to use the word conservative values, but they seem to have those um, in terms of wanting to have a work ethic, wanting to succeed, wanting to, you know, produce and, and do something great with their life. Yeah, uh, you know, what? I mean, my 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 most experience with that is my kids and my oldest is out of college. He's been working now for a couple of years and, and I see a similar work ethic in him as I had it. You know, I still have, but I had at that age as well. And my other two kids, the way they study and my, my daughter is graduating. So the intensity which which she's looking for jobs and the way she approaches employers seems very much like the way I did things. So mm -hmm. I don't know if if my wife and I had a good effect on the kids or if this is more widespread or if it's just a generational gap and the older generation doesn't really understand them and they're labeling <laughs> them as lazy or don't want to work. But that's not necessarily true. Right. Um, well, the, according well, and what this study is referring to, it's not really just labeling them lazy. It's the it's you know the attitudes that they have towards bringing, you know, certain ideas and 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 cultures into the workplace. Right. That's that's specifically what this was. You know, this study was related to. Uh, Fifty seven percent of those surveys said that Gen Z runs the most risk of creating a workplace lawsuit. Um, Newsweek has come out and and uh, said basically much the same thing. So, you know, they're you know they have have, have much more of a attitude of bringing more of these uh, kind of liberal attitudes towards the workplace well, that don't necessarily conform with the traditional workplace environment of working eight to five, showing up on time, doing the work you're assigned to do. You know, maybe having to go above and beyond to succeed. You know, the, that, those are the things that, you know, are, are the problems that a lot of these workplace employers are dealing with. Yeah, but, you know, I also think we grew, you know, when we first started working, the workplace environment was very different. First of all, we had to wear suits and ties. It was very buttoned up, very conservative from a, you know, a yeah. dress perspective and be at your desk from nine to five perspective. Uh, but also there was a lot of sexism, racism that was tolerated. Uh, and I think the young, well, I know the younger generation doesn't put up with that. Whereas, you know, people our age and older, that's the way we kind of grew up. That's kind of what we think is, you know, we don't think it's necessarily correct, but that's how we think of a workplace. So I think you have a lot of friction between the mindsets of the younger and the older. And this whole remote thing has also kind of screwed things up. They, you know, I think younger generations think that's part of the job that you should be able to work home some days a week, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's a couple or, or the whole week. Uh, whereas again, we grew up in an office surrounded by, by the pe by our colleagues. And that's just not something we're used to. You know, and that's, so just, it's, it, you know, and that's an interesting point to bring up now, because there was just a survey out yesterday that shows that if, you know, we talked about job switchers previously, how people were able to, to quit one job and switch to another job and get paid more money. The, the job switching that will give you up to a 30% increase is switching from a work from home job to, to an office job. So this is now the, right. new, the new trend is if you want higher, higher pay, you have to go back to the office and work. Yeah. And you know what? It's a good thing. Um, like I'm glad my son is, uh, has to be in the office at least two days a week. And I think he goes three or four because I think he finds value in it. He's talking to not only his boss, but his boss's boss. He's being better exposed. But, you know, again, I think a lot of kids just go the minimum and they're the ones losing out. They're also not becoming friendly. Like some of my good friends in my early 20s were people I worked with. So they're missing out on potential relationships with, you know, with their colleagues, which also I think helps your career as well. Oh, yeah. You know, a, as you move on, though, those colleagues find other jobs and potentially can help you find jobs and vice versa. Well, no, and, and, you know, and true, you know, and to your point is, you know, when you're in the workplace, you build relationships with people with more experience, they become mentors, they show you the ropes, they uh, teach you the things that you didn't know you didn't know. Um, you know, and again, that's, you know, that, that type of education, and again, you know, like, yeah, great. We go to college, we get a degree. 
And when I graduated college, uh, the guy that was giving our commencement speech said the one line that has stuck with me my whole life is in college, you didn't learn anything about the work world. All you learned was how to take a problem and go find information. That's that's really all you learned in college was how to source information. He says, once you get out into the real world, your education will begin because you're going to work with people that have been in situations before and they're going to tell you, hey, this is how this is going to turn out. This is what you need to know. And that's how you really learn. And, and the problem is, is when we all work remote, we lose that. You lose that connectivity. You lose that interaction. You lose that educational experience that you get from learning from other people's experiences. Right, right. And it's not just the technical aspects of a job. It's how do you deal with a bad boss or a good boss or a mm -hmm. bad colleague or good colleague. And, and you know, office politics. Uh, you know, office politics are not what they used to be. And maybe some of that is good, but I think a lot of it is a learning process that helps people advance their careers. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. So it, you know, it's going to be interesting. It's it's there's there's definitely a a a differential um, between even between Gen Zs and millennials and millennials and and you know Gen Xers. There's there's certainly you know very different attitudes towards workplace, the economy, you know, spending, investing, all those type of things. So it's going to be it's going to be very interesting to see how our kids when they get out into the world and I'm, I'm anxious about it. Right. So when my kids graduate college, they go get their jobs and, and start, you know, proceeding forward as young adults. I'm very anxious to see how they, how they turn out and what they, they wind up doing. So. Right. And be here's, here's an important part. Here's an important point. This is a very interesting topic, but if we're kind of thinking, going back to kind of investing in the economy and the markets, and we're looking out 20 years, what matters most to the economy is productivity. So if it turns out that that the Gen Zs are just less productive, and you know that hasn't necessarily been proven out yet, but if that turns out to be the fact, and a lot of us old folks are gone out of business, and they are the predominant workers, less productivity results in less economic growth, which means less wealth, less prosperity for the nation and for the people. So this may be there may be a much longer term implication to this if in fact it turns out to be the fact yeah no it's 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 that's an interesting point because the one thing i've i've been trying to wrap my mind around is you know in the world that we live in today there's people that you know they they go out they build a social media platform and they become influencers right so they get paid to promote other people's products well if everybody's just out doing influencing then who's doing the buying and who's working to earn the salary <laughs> <laughs> to, to right, buy the right. products they're promoting, uh, you know, and and again, this whole AI thing is going to be very interesting because you know, with artificial intelligence, you can create an influencer with artificial intelligence. You don't need to pay anybody for anything. Um, AI will do it all for you. I can take your image. I can create a whole caricature around you and have it automatically generate videos and you know, YouTube channels and you name it, and collect money from that and. You know, there's nobody there. It's just AI. So I think that's going to be the, the the biggest thing going forward is how this changes the productivity scale for young people with AI. Go ahead. I was going to say, maybe I'm just an AI character <laughs> already and you just don't know it. <laughs> yeah, trust me. I, I, I know. Anyway. All right. Wraps up the show for the day. <laughs> we'll be back uh, tomorrow, of course. Uh, no, tomorrow. Uh, good Friday. Be back on Monday. Uh, have a good weekend. Markets close tomorrow. Uh, so we'll see you back here Monday as we start the month of April and earnings season. So that's all coming up next. All right. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Happy Easter.